Hey, everybody. I would like to welcome Pavan Metarata to the show. He retired early on short-term rental income, and today he is going to tell us how he did it. How are you doing, Pavan? Hey, Avery. I'm great. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yes. Thank you so much for coming. So tell me how you got started. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got the idea to invest in short-term rentals, because you were a little bit of an early adopter in this type of investment. So just tell us a little bit about uh, how you got here. So we started, uh, my wife and I started long-term rentals back in the early 2000s. Um, in 2011-ish, we decided we wanted to buy a condo on the beach, and we were going to eventually retire there. Uh, we Took, took us about two years to find a spot. So 2011 is when we closed in our first condo. We went with the on-site rental management company. We were like, we're going to live here forever. It's 900 square feet. It's perfect. And we realized, oh, wait, it's not perfect. It's really small. Um, but we started making money in the short-term rental business with a property manager. And we realized that we could do this much better ourselves um, and that the returns that were unbelievable. So we ended up taking control management by the end of 2011. Um, we gradually started scaling up. 2014, we added. 2017, we added. Um, and then we realized, hey, this is actually a viable business. We 1031 all our long-term rentals into short-term rentals. Uh, we left our corporate jobs. And since then, today, we are at 15, going on 16 units. Um, we have this constant debate about long-term versus short-term, but we are all in on short-term rentals just because the numbers, you can't beat them. That is true. So tell us which markets you are in for your short-term rentals right now. Yep. So we started in Siesta Key, Florida, which is the number one beach in the world. We're thrilled to be here. We actually live here now, it's about 15 minutes from our properties. Uh, we have four units on the beach. There are beachfront rentals. Uh, we have 11 units that are closing on our 12th uh, in the beginning of March in the Smoky Mountains which is another one of the top tourist destinations in the U.S. if not the world. So we are a strong believer in finding short-term rentals in a true vacation market um, because we've seen, we've been through hurricanes now, we've been through wildfires, uh, we went through a pandemic. Um, and in fact, last year was one of our best years ever because especially in the mountains, people were escaping uh, urban life, going to the mountains to social distance, to have a house where they could cook their own food. Um, they can be alone and have Wi-Fi and get work done. So we are um, very thrilled to be in these two markets. We're exploring other markets, um, but you know, I think we have processes and systems and teams in place now that makes it a little more challenging to launch into a new market. But that's not saying we, we won't do that in the future. Yeah, it is. It's really, really easy to just add a unit to your existing system than to start an entirely yeah. new market for sure. So it's pretty easy to self-manage a vacation rental in 2020, but you got in really early. What did self-management look like back then? Because uh, I know there probably weren't a lot of the automation tools that we have now. Right, right. Luckily, we, so we scaled a little slower. So we learned a lot along the way. We started self-managing in 2011. Um, and the, you know, there's a couple of things. I was in marketing but in my previous career, so I always follow the four P's of marketing. Um, but I also added on, you know, people, process, and systems. And having the people in place is the most important thing you can do. Uh, the number one, having a great housekeeper who has your eyes and ears on the ground and a handyman that's reliable. Um, you can pick up the phone or text and call and get a hold of right away. And then having a, the network in place of the trades people, uh, electricians, plumbers, as needed. Uh, we use apps like Tax, uh, Fiverr, TaskRabbit to get people where we need them, or if we had a certain job that needs to get done, pick up a piece of furniture for point A and transport it to point B. Um, so it was challenging in the beginning. We had we went through a lot of housekeeping staff. We were probably on our 10th housekeeping housekeeper in the in here at the beach. Um, so finding the right one was a challenge. Being remote was a challenge. We, we managed remotely for six years or seven years at the beach, and now we were managing remotely at the mountains for three years. So it's definitely doable. Um, that you got to have the right people. You got to put the processes in place, uh, systematize things like supply ordering, um, systematize your scheduling. So setting up the, the Google Calendar, which you know, we still had back in 2011, to be able to manage and coordinate cleanings. Um, so it's been much better now the last two years since we have better systems in place. Uh, but it, it definitely was you know, a lot of Excel, uh, a 
lot of texting uh, back in the day. And fortunately, like we learned a lot along the way, we were small enough that we were able to manage it. But I never realized until we started scaling how much time I was spending on this stuff. I uh, still am, even though it's definitely not a passive uh, investment. You, you have to actively take a, take a role if you want to self-manage and you want to make money. I agree. So one thing I want to zoom in on that you said is that you're on your 10th housekeeper. So that is a really big fear of a lot of new investors or people that are interested in getting into short terms, but they never do. Uh, they're afraid of their housekeeper not showing up. So can you speak a little right. bit about like, you know, what that looks like? You know, to me, it's it's going to happen eventually. Your housekeeper is going right. to miss a clean eventually. It's not if, it's when. But can you just talk about, uh, you know, why that's just part of the business and it's not necessarily, I mean, it is the worst thing that could happen in terms of a guest stay, but it is manageable. Right. I mean, so we've hosted in the last year a thousand stays and you know, we can't have every one go perfect. We have had missed cleans, whether it was a, a last minute booking that maybe I forgot to communicate, which is rare or I just happened to fall off the cleaner schedule. Um, you will miss a clean. You will have guests come to a dirty cabin. Uh, we, what we're doing now is we actually have two different housekeepers. So we have a backup. So in the beach, we have four units that so we have one handle to each. And in the mountains, we have two, two separate cleaners. Um, the handle kind of half and half. So we have backups in place. If a guest comes to a dirty property, Someone can come and take care of it right away. So the worst case is we reform the cleaning fee, apologize profusely, and move on. And usually people are, are okay with that. We, um, you will go through housekeepers. You may lose some linens along the way. Um, you know, when you hire staff, the most that's the most important decision you can make in any business is your hiring process. So let them get references. You know, follow through on the cleaning if you can the first time. Um, do a you know, surprise guest, secret shopper, see how it's going, uh, and have a backup plan in place is all I can say is make sure you have a backup, whether somebody you don't know or a neighbor or a friend, uh, if you can have someone that you can rely on to get in and get something done while you scramble uh, to find a new housekeeper. We've, had, we've done that before. We've had a case where housekeeper just quit, and we had a full schedule of cleans. We drove around our area, and we looked at the signs, and call people, set up interviews, and have somebody hired the next day. But it's definitely, it could be stressful, but it's part of the business. And if it was easy, everyone would be doing it. That's true. And that's genius to have two housekeepers running at a time because a lot of people have the idea of, okay, I, I want a backup housekeeper, but they just go to some second housekeeper and say, I want to have you as my backup, and then never talk to them again while the other right. one's working. And then they have no incentive when you do need them to get up and and go take care of the clean that your other housekeeper missed. So that's genius to have two running yeah. all the time. So then they're kind of obligated to help you because they work for you already. Right. right. And we'll, we'll even alternate deep clean. So cleaner A will deep clean cleaners B unit and cleaner B will deep clean cleaners A unit because they all see different things. Um, and this way, it also kind of keeps them on their toes as well. So um, we have, we alternate deep cleans. We sometimes alternate people in the actual unit themselves. So we invest in extra linens. Uh, we don't do laundry on site, so we have you know six sets of linens per bed with two different housekeepers. So it, yeah, it's a little expensive for setup, but once you get going, then you know you're in business, and then you swap out the linens as needed. Um, so it's, it's definitely worth the like I said, upfront investment with the interview and vet, and up upfront investment in your inventory. So you can handle missing linens, stains, rips, tears, housekeeping changes. Um, definitely having a backup in place. For your all your stuff, even your handyman is, is critical. And when you fire a housekeeper or or they quit, you can pretty much guarantee you're gonna lose a set of linens. Whichever set of linens they oh. have with them, they're not bringing that back. Now we've been lucky. We've <laughs> fortunately gotten most of our stuff back. But I have heard stories where uh, uh, that has happened before. <laughs> I've never seen it not happen. So you're <laughs> you're really lucky. <laughs> So I want to back up a little bit. Tell me about your long-term rentals. So how many of those did you have that you unloaded to go all in on short terms? Yep, we had six doors long-term. We had a fourplex, a duplex, and a condo. And starting in 2011, we started 1031 those, in 1031 those into short-term rentals. So now we're completely out um, of long-term 
people are trying to convince me to go to multifamily, and there's a lot of buzz around multifamily because it's been around forever. Uh, you know some of those people, and uh, mm-hmm. I'm still, I'm not sold on that. I think soft short term is the way to go. The numbers are unbelievable, and once you get a system in place and your process is in place, then like you said earlier, adding one on is is gravy. It's, it's, I mean, it's work, but once it's in, it's easy, easier. Absolutely. So let's talk about at the point you quit your job, because that is what most short-term rental investors goals are. Can you talk a little bit about what your job was? Because I know you and your wife both had some seriously high income jobs that you walked away from to invest in this kind of stuff. So can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah. So I was a head of marketing for a billion dollar business, legal software company, and my wife was an attorney. So we actually, we had a decent income stream coming on. It was a little scary to walk away from that. Um, our goal, we had a certain goal in mind of where we wanted to be, um, cash flow wise, month to month. Uh, we definitely were going to scale back our lifestyle. We thought we were going to at least. Um, and then when we left our jobs, we were going to retire. And I made a big proclamation. I'm retiring you guys. And, uh, we moved to the beach and we got here and realized that for A, we didn't retire because we still have this business to run. And B, I had time now to actually think about how to grow. So in the last two years, we've added, you know, we had, we had eight units last year and just in 2020, we added another four, four before that. So we, um, and we also spent more money because we're living here where we have, don't have jobs to go to from eight to five. So we're doing out and about doing things. We bought a boat. So we have, uh, we're spending more money. So we did the speed our lifestyle that way as well. Um, and now I can say we're at the point where we're making more money off our investments, our short-term investments than we were in our day jobs. Um, but the day jobs definitely helped us get started. And we threw every single penny we had back into uh, investing, to paying things off, uh, taking HELOX out, kind of roll, so getting things rolling. So once you get started, it starts to snowball quickly. I think you've noticed that, um, you know, it's the first one, two, and then it starts to go, the cash flow starts coming in. And you just put it right back into the business and you can really scale up fairly quickly. Yeah, you can you can go really, really quickly. Uh, yeah. So do you have when you're looking at these short term rentals and you're in several markets now, is there a preferred size or do you buy a range of sizes or do you stick to one certain thing? Uh, so that's a good question. We debate this uh, a lot. Um, one thing that during this last 2020 pandemic proved to me was that the, a smaller unit will rent because it's easy for a couple or a small family to get away. So our focus has been more on the smaller size. Our condos are all two bedroom, two bathroom, uh, good for you know, a couple or a small family. There's two couples traveling together. Our cabins are mainly one, two bedrooms, um, sleep up to six people. So again, you know, two couples, a small family traveling together. Um, I do know, you know, the debate has been, let's go bigger because the numbers scale uh, linearly when you go to a, a bigger cabin, for example, in the Smokies. Um, you know, you have one roof to take care of versus multiple roofs, one HVAC versus that versus that. So the expenses can be a little less um, challenges. You know, you have the party thing like Airbnb is big on these parties that happen. You have to worry about um, during the pandemic, the beginning stages, at least. I think the bigger units didn't weren't occupied because getting a large group together of 10, 12, 14 people was problematic. Um, I still think there's opportunity there. Our, our next cabin that we're closing on on March 4th is a four bedroom, four or five bedroom cabin that will sleep up to 14 people. Um, I'm excited, I've, I've wanted to get a bigger property for a while, so this will be our first one and uh, confident, I'm confident it's gonna do well. Uh, I'm a little worried about the whole party aspect and uh, more damage things to take care of, but again, we have people in place to help manage that and then we need to get anything bad that happens. So, so yeah, I'll, I was all about small, 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 and now we're scaling bigger. I know people that have had great success with with larger cabins and larger houses on the beach, for example, as well. So you're in two markets. You mentioned you got into the Florida market uh, because that's where you guys got married. Uh, How do you, and you also mentioned that you're maybe looking into a few new ones as well. How do you identify a market that you might be interested in going into? Now, so I mentioned earlier for me, it's, I want want to go into a true vacation market. I don't want to go into like the New York city, that's not fully tourist dependent and places are H or not HOA, STR friendly. So then you're not going to have to worry about regulation and HOA changes. 
uh, that could impact your investment. So just the key, for example, is extremely FTR friendly, um, right along the actual key itself on the beach itself. It's almost, I would say, not, you know, 80% condos. So, and their business is tourism. So I don't see anything changing there. Same thing with the Smoky Mountains. There's 10,000 plus cabins there. They're, the whole economy is driven by tourism. So someplace that's tourism friendly, um, um, Panhandle in Florida is a good market. I know, I know you're growing there. You know, we're looking, we were looking at Sedona, Arizona, for example, which is also a big market, but there, there's some uh, rumblings about you know, people, the environment not being conducive to continuing short term rentals because the residents are getting upset about it. So um, that would be one place I would investigate, but probably have, perhaps tread lightly. So for me, it's all about vacation. We're doing short, not just short term rentals, but vacation rentals. And that's been, it's proven to be successful for us. And I don't see us moving away from that model. And plus, it, it gives us a chance, it gives us a chance to vacation somewhere. So the beach we chose because we, about marriage here, you mentioned, um, we love going to the beach here. We're beach people. Um, it does the same thing with the Smoky Mountains. We love to hike. It's great to go there, especially in the summertime when it's super hot in Florida. Um, so I would like, to, you know, for me, it's a personal decision. I want to go, I want to buy some place that I want to go. And makes it easy for me to hang out there and spend an extended period of time if I choose um, to do that. Yeah, and that's my exact model too. Is we don't we don't go into metro markets really, or uh, really even the big fly to vacation markets either, like Hawaii or Colorado or any yeah. of the Colorado markets. Because uh, I found that there's two things that contribute the most to anti short term rental regulation, and it's a lot of permanent residents in the market and then also a, a lot of hotel presence. So, right. you know, anywhere where people have always rented houses like the Panhandle of Florida, you mentioned lots of beach markets and lots of mountain markets yep. are like that uh, is generally a better for me, a better choice than trying to contend with all the regulations of a big metro market. I agree. Awesome. So what tell me, so you've, You've been in the game long enough to have been a buyer in a lot of different market conditions. So uh, tell me what constituted a good deal when you first started and can you compare and contrast that to the current market where it's a really tight right. seller's market? It is tight. Um, we're still buying. So, you know, I have a number in mind for cash. Uh, my main metric these days is cash on cash return. And if it's less than 20%, I won't look at it. Um, and there's still money to be made and there's still, you can still get that return. You know, in 2017, you were getting 40%. Now maybe you're getting 20%, which is still a pretty freaking good return. Um, I wish I would have bought more earlier. I think everyone does. People keep asking, oh, when's the market going to cool down? Will it cool down? When will prices go down? I mean, if I knew that, I'd be a billionaire. Um, so I don't know the answer to that. But I do think there are deals to be found. You have to run your numbers. Um, um, look at your metrics, what, you're, what you define as success, and if you can meet that criteria, move forward. So we are definitely finding deals. It's a lot tougher. I would, I would have scaled probably quicker last year if we could have found more deals. So whenever I find one, I, I jump on it. Uh, I am still looking. We're still growing. Uh, you know, I guess we're closing on one in March, and we're still in the market. One thing I have found is it, it's tougher to find a turnkey investment you have to be willing to put a little sweat equity into it so building your network of other trade people and contractors that can do a little more of the heavy lifting um you know buying a cabin or a property that's not fully furnished uh, which you know people don't want to deal with decorating and buying and sourcing all that stuff so i think it's a little more to find a good deal you have to put a little more into it you're not going to find the perfect property that's ready to roll turnkey um at a good price point. You can still find them, you're just gonna pay more. And now you have to look at your numbers again and say, hey, does this work for my numbers or not? Yeah, I mean, it used to be you could, there was actual negotiation that could be done on a purchase yeah, price. No. And yeah, it's that those days are gone, at least for now. Right. And um, now you just, if a property hits the market for 500,000, you have to now run the numbers and say, okay, well, the numbers make sense up to 550. There are, for me, there are right. 10 other offers on it. So I'm going to go up to 550. Or if the numbers only make sense up to 450, then maybe you pass. Whereas a deal, you what used to constitute a deal was the discount you could get off the purchase price, but that's not right. the case anymore. 
Exactly. And, you, and that's why you can't be afraid to offer over asking and waive uh, some of the contingencies or waive appraisals. If the numbers work for you, make the offer. Don't, I don't even look at the price, history price anymore. People are like, oh, this sold for, you know, 50% less three years ago. It doesn't matter. What's the selling for now? And do, do today's numbers work for you in your model? And if they work, then make the offer. If they don't work, then move on and find something that does. You, you can't base it on history. You can't base it on discount. You just got to go for what works in your specific instance of these numbers working for you. If they are, make the offer. And then my strategy has been, Offer the asking price or above asking, and they have go through inspection and see if you can do some more negotiation at that point because you already have a seller that's bought into the process, and that they may be willing to work with you a little more uh, to get the deal done. So we've been applying that strategy for a while, and it seems to be fairly successful. Yeah, I think a lot of new investors get really caught up in what someone else paid for the property, but I mean, right. it doesn't matter when you're buying the seller most likely unless you're buying a foreclosure pay less than what you're going to pay <laughs> so right, right. it's it's pointless to even look at that in my opinion it's solely based on income versus what you're paying for it exactly awesome so while we're on the subject of numbers can you give us like an example maybe a case study of a deal that you've done of what what the numbers look like uh let's maybe use one of your cs to key properties as an example Sure. So Siesta Key, let's say purchase price. To the, let's talk our first one because uh, that was my favorite one because that's what got us into this business and launched us uh, to where we are today. That property I bought in 2000, February of 2011 for 375 k um, Today, if I were to sell it, it would probably sell in the low sixes, I think. Um, it, that property will gross between 70 to 85 a year, depending on the year, depending on hurricane, depending on pandemic. But um, it'll average around 80k a year gross, and then you're gonna have your expenses probably be you know your housekeeping is included as part of the gross. So any money you take in, you're gonna have your expenses as housekeeping, utilities. It's an HOA, so my HOA fees are ridiculous. There, they're 755 a month, which takes a big chunk out of the profitability. Um, but you're still gonna end up with a decent profit. End up with a, over a 30% cash on cash return um, if you put, say, for example, 20% down in this case, which we did at the time of purchase. So um, a beach property, a 2-2 on the beach with a view, it's gonna stay rented because you have a view. I'm all about differentiating my properties. And I think as in the beach market, view is a huge differentiator. Um, we have three seasons. We have you know, our high season, which is snowbirds, and spring breakers, in January, it's about April to May. We have summer season, which is family vacationers until about school starts until mid-August. Then from mid-August until about Christmas time is low season. And if you can fill low season, that's when you're going to make a lot of money because everyone can be, will be busy during, you know, high season, mid season. It's the shoulder season, the, the low season that's going to really differentiate you. If you have something, a, a product that people want and they want to be on the beach and see the beach, then that's definitely um, a great differentiator and you're going to make your money that way. That's why we, our gross numbers, I think are pretty decent for a 2-2, two -two, um, a 900 square foot condo. Um, and we're, like, we're probably busy, I would say, 48 weeks a year. We take a week out of service for deep clean, for upgrades, painting, this and that. Um, and then we'll have a little bit of, you know, sporadic time where it's, it's just not full. But that's, that's to be expected. You can't be full 100% of the time. Absolutely. So you caught me on the word HOA. So a lot of new yeah. investors see an HOA fee and it just stops them in their tracks. And they say, never mind, no condos, it has to be a single family. <laughs> Can you talk to me a little bit about HOA fees and what they cover and why that should not be something that stops an investor in their tracks? Yeah, I, honestly, the, our HOA fee is high and I prefer it to be lower. Um, what our HOA covers is our water, which is nice. It covers our, our internet. It covers um, the internet cable, water, all the grounds maintenance, all the physical maintenance of the structures. So you don't have to worry about a roof. You don't have to worry about you know, the, how the lawn looks, you have to pay for everything inside the walls. Um, the, all the plumbing outside is covered, uh, electricity outside is covered. So basically it's a little less, it's less work from that perspective. I don't have to worry about taking care of things. Um, they, we have a good HOA who has been really um, diligent about keeping a decent reserve. So we never have had an assessment in, you know, 10 years. And we're able to do projects like 
you know, put pavers in the, into the an entryway, redo all the roofs. Um, it's been, it's been nice to be able to cede some of that responsibility. We do pay for it. Um, but I do know if you have a well managed HOA, um, it's a plus. And, and it's a very, also, like I said earlier, a very vacation rent, vacation rental friendly HOA because that's how out of, uh, we have 83 units in our complex and about 90% of those units are on vacation rental. So we have very few permanent residents. I don't see that changing. So I don't see the, the rules changing as well either to, um, to go away from vacation rental. Yeah, that's the plus about a lot of beach markets is that there's going to be very few condo buildings or HOAs that you have to worry about that are going to not allow short term rentals because they're just that's the whole reason they were built, basically, is to be like a resort. So right. that's awesome. Uh, so you mentioned on your first condo that you financed it 20 percent down. Did you do just a conventional investment loan on all your properties or did you do anything correct, creative financing wise on any of them? We've done, we've done, um, the condos are a little harder to finance these days because a lot of them are condo tells that they have a front desk. Uh, so yeah, first one was 20% down. We've done a couple 10% or one 10%, um, second home loan. We've done cash out refinances. We've done HELOCs out of, um, current properties to buy new properties. And then obviously we just pay cash for something. So. A little bit of mix. We haven't had to do. I, I've taken a, had a portfolio loan with a, with a bank at one time, which I refinanced. So I would say portfolio, HELOC, cash, obviously, um, and conventional ten percent, twenty percent down loans have been our method of acquisition to date. So you've done a little bit of everything. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. Yeah. And we partner with people as well. I don't, I don't want to get into that, but we've had some partnerships yeah. where we brought some money in and um, and had different structures we have three different partnerships going right now actually um where money comes where money comes from another source and we do you know the manual labor part of it as well yeah and uh, partnerships can be a really great way to get started especially if you are not the money person uh because oh. managing the property is a really great way to put some sweat equity in and to bring some value to the table if money is not the value that you bring so it can be a really great exactly. way to to scale for sure. Right. Yeah. So Pavan, what would you tell your former self? Uh, I mean, other than I'd buy, buy more properties because I would too. Uh, your former <laughs> self, like when you first got started, is there anything you would have done differently up to what you've, what up to now or anything that, what, just what would you tell yourself? Yeah, I think you can't underestimate the importance of getting your processes and people in place. Um, I mentioned it before it. Everything I was doing earlier was very manual. You had, had a spreadsheet here, had a Word doc here. Um, you know, I was on the phone all the time trying to sort through issues. Um, having the right team, starting with your agent, who will help you find the property and source and work through all the issues that come along with that to your housekeeper, to your handyman. Um, I would tell myself, spend more time up front hiring so you don't go through, you don't go through 10 housekeepers. Uh, put those processes in place so when you do add, uh, which you ultimately will want to do, you don't have to keep reinventing the wheel. And I did that a lot until we got to this point and I realized I couldn't do it anymore. Um, get help earlier. We hired our first assistant just this year, actually. I wish I would have done it a year ago. Um, so don't be afraid to ask for help. That's probably another thing, whether you hire somebody or you're networking within your peer group. Um, because people, everyone has done this before, especially at the, by the, you know, 2021, there's a lot of people doing this business and there's a lot of good insight to share. I mean, you're great at sharing your information and your knowledge. Um, so don't be afraid to ask questions. And you'll find, I think, that people are really happy to share. Like, I love talking about this stuff. It's my favorite <laughs> topic. So we're at a party. My wife said, what are you talking about? I'm like, my favorite topic. She's like, okay, I'm going to show up. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we met you, actually, <laughs> yeah, talking exactly, about this at a exactly. party. <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, are there any uh, are there any books that have helped you along the way? Any favorite investing or business books? Um, my favorite book is probably an older book, um, Cash Flow Quadrant. For me, it, it helped quantify and put words around some of the things that we were already feeling and doing. But as far as being an investor versus an employee, I think it really just helped broaden my mind and my wife's mind and my family's mind up that the opportunities that are ahead of us and how to change your mindset. So cash flow quadrant 
It's probably one of my favorite books. Um, I think I've read it twice. I recommend it multiple times. It's, it's kind of a hard reading to get through it. And if you haven't read Rich Dad Poor Dad, I'll read that first and then read Cash Flow Quadrant. It's a little bit repetitive, but it's definitely worth it. Um, if you're on the fence whether to get into this business, um, I think it really help crystallize some of the, the thoughts and the process on how you can shift your mindset to actually be successful in this type of business. I love that book. Actually, I'm more of a reader than a listener of audiobooks, but I did listen to Cash Flow Quadrant on the road one okay. time and it, it was pretty easily digestible listening. Normally I can't listen because I my mind wanders, but that one I was able to to concentrate on. So yeah, last question. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> no, I have a listen. Maybe I'll listen to it next time. I've only read it. So. Oh yeah. It's uh it it got me through a four hour drive. <laughs> Well, cool. So last question, and you've already given us uh, an idea of what you would have told your former self uh, knowing now, or if you had known then what you know now, there are a lot of new investors out there and there are a lot of limiting beliefs. What would you tell them to dispel those limiting beliefs? I would say, you know, it's run your numbers. First of all, um, be prepared to have problems. You're going to have issues with the guests. You're going to have to um, give refunds. You know, you're going to be upset because you got a bad review. It happens all the time. Don't be afraid. So don't be afraid to get in. Um, pick a place you like and you want to spend time in. That always makes it easier. Pick a place that you can convert to a long-term rental if you ultimately have to. I think that's been, I've read about that before as well, especially during the pandemic time. People have been doing more long-term rentals. So think about um, other ways that you can monetize this investment, not just a vacation rental or a short-term rental. Um, can you do a long-term? Can you, you know, you can always flip it as well. So you will, you will make money if you self-manage and you know what you're doing and you have this the place, you have a network of people you can talk to, whether it's on Facebook or, you know, any other social network, um, definitely tap into that. Um, don't go into analysis paralysis. Use, you know, look at your market, see what else, what other people are doing. Look at other properties on VRBO or Airbnb, see what they're charging. You can get a good idea of occupancy and rates. I'll plug it into your, you know, deal calculator and go from there. And um, don't overanalyze. People will come. If you're in the vacation market, people will come. If you list it, they will come. Great, great closing words. <laughs> great sound bite. <laughs> Mic drop. <laughs> <laughs> well, Pavan, thank you so, so much for coming. You're obviously a hugely successful short-term rental investor, and we are very happy to have you on the podcast. That was fun. Thank you much for having me. Awesome.